And there we have YouTube. And there we go. Okay, and as I understand now from YouTube, we are live. Yes. Okay, so let me start by our trailer. So let's go for the trailer. So you guys know what you're watching, right? Okay, we are back. So, sorry we started a little bit late, and let me explain to that. We do have some problems over here. If something goes wrong, it could be that we are offline and that we don't come back because it's that sort of problem. But I think I actually jerry-rigged it or MacGyvered it or whatever, so I think this will be okay. And I think the audio will be a little bit louder also now. So if somebody in the chat can tell me what the audio quality is, so then we know that we can start because today we have a very, very small team. We have our model. We have myself and we have Anna Week. So we have to make sure that before I go into the studio, that the audio is great. So if someone in the chat can say that the audio is good, then we are ready to go. And I think it is. So, okay, so today it's all about something that a lot of people ask me about, like how many strobes do I need in my studio? How many things do we need? How many do we need from this? How many do we need from that? And in the essence, it's actually you don't need anything. You only need light and of course a camera. But nowadays the camera can be even your phone, right? We do have a whole workshop called the mobile workflow, by the way. And I think very soon, and I have to look at Anna Week, we are actually gonna do a digital classroom about the mobile workflow, right? Yes. Yes, and that means that we're going to start with shooting some images, then we're going to take a little bit of a break of like five minutes, and then we're going to show you how to upload those images into your iPad, how to edit them in Lightroom on the iPad, so we're not going to use anything else than the iPad, and maybe a little bit of Photoshop on the iPad. It's all on the iPad. So that's your mantra on the iPad. So today, it's about lighting. But what kind of lighting? Now, you know from Digital Classroom that we try to do topic-wise uh, episodes. Sometimes we just do a photo shoot, but mostly it's topic-wise. And I thought, you know what, let's just show people what you can do with only one light. Now, I know that there are all these labels like One Light Man or One Light Wonder or the One Light Magician. Don't think that with one light you can do everything. That's something that just isn't true. The only thing I always tell people is, if you think you need two lights, start with one. If you, need, if you think you need three lights, start with one. A good friend of mine, Rick Salmon, actually stole that, but it's, it's mine. <laughs> and how did that start? Actually, it started pretty simple. We were experimenting with some background lighting. And the background lighting at one point just didn't work the way that I wanted. It was constantly moving. There wasn't a great harmony between the main light and the backlight. And I was just going like, I don't know. I like that light on the backdrop, but it's so annoying that every time that I move, that that light moves. And I started to think, why not just simplify it and start with just one light? Now, at first, that's terrible because you don't know where the shadows fall. And that's actually where you have to start to think a little bit like Dexter, the splatter specialist, right? The serial killer. So as soon as he sees a body, he will start drawing those lines like, okay, and this was a blunt object, look at the spatters there. As a photographer, we have to do the same thing. Of course, don't kill people or look at blood, but what we have to do is make sure that we follow the lines and the lines of light. So if you see a shadow on the back and you don't want that shadow, and you want that shadow to be gone, you don't need to use Photoshop. The only thing you have to do is follow the line and see like, ah, oh, okay, the light is a little bit too low. There's a shadow on the backdrop, let's raise that light. Oh, I still see a little bit of that shadow. Maybe just go down a little bit and shoot up. Shadow is gone. The same thing goes for left and right, where you place your strobes. If you place it to the left, you will have a shadow on the right side, right? Yes. So everything is actually pretty much calculated and everything you can see right in front of you happening. This is also why I sometimes don't understand the questions like, hey, how can I get the shadow out? Just look through the viewfinder and move or move your lighting. And one of the best tips I actually can give people is use your phone. Use, the smart, uh, use your smartphone, use your uh, flashlight on it. It just works like a charm to see on objects what happens. But today it's about one lighting. Yeah, 
but what kind of modifiers do you use? Yeah, that's the big question, right? What kind of modifiers do you use? Well, we had planned some really cool stuff, which I hope I can still do, but because we have some issues, we couldn't set it up, but that was actually with gels. So maybe in between, when we have a break, we can still MacGyver something with the gels. Let's hope so. But first, we are gonna start with a very, very nice softbox from Hensel, the Grand 90. That's a 90 centimeter um, uh, softbox. And one of the nice things about that softbox, let me just show you on camera so you can see what we're talking about. I think it's this one, yes. And one of the nice things about that softbox, and you can actually see it here from the side, is that that softbox really has a nice octal. And I don't know how to pronounce it in English, but it's an octa. Yes, so it has many different sides. And that's one of the things that frustrated the heck out of me when I started with photography with softboxes, they were square. And somehow you always had those nasty reflections in the eyes of a square softbox. So you can take them out, but then you get those really dead eyes, which you don't want, of course, unless you go for that look. But no, don't go for that look. So how do you get it round? Well, you can do it in Photoshop, but that's a long work every time. And if, oh no. So use an Octa. With an Octa, you get a really nice, almost round spotlight in your eyes, the catch light. Okay, so what can you do with that one light source? Let's just try, let's just try some images with only one light source, in this case, the 90 centimeters. We're gonna start straight on front, we're gonna move it to the sides, and then we're gonna see if we can create something on the backdrop. And of course, we have a beautiful backdrop from back click prop backdrops. So Anouik, are you ready to take over for me? Do you dare to touch everything? <laughs> I'm gonna try. Okay, and Chewie, of course, is also with us, but he's now on the floor. Oh, not anymore because I called out his name. I'm sorry, buddy. Just stay asleep. Okay, let me grab a light meter for now. And, oh, don't fall. And let's just see what we can do. Okay, so here we have our 90 centimeters. It's really nice. Let's turn it on. Then it works way better. And we have a beautiful backdrop. I still miss the model, but that will be okay. That will be in a few seconds, of course. Just stay there, I will call you. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna just aim it straight at our model. So I don't know what the settings is at the moment. We'll just try something out. So let's just raise this a little bit to make sure that we don't have a nasty shadow right away. Nasty shadows can come later. Okay. Make sure that you tighten it. Okay, now I need a model. And of course we have one sitting in the studio always. Like whenever I leave, she's, we always have a model here, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah, totally. Too cool. Okay, let's try something with the light meter. Okay, now the first thing you have to know about the light meter is it's not a tool that makes you a better photographer, it just makes you faster. So let's just hold it in front of the area I want correctly lit. And let's just first remove my memories. Uh, let me see, memory, memory clear. Perfect. There we go. Okay, in front of the area. Don't hit your model. 2.2. Well, that's of course on the very, very low side. We want a lot more. So let's just raise the volume. The power, I mean, of course. Okay, let's try that again. And there we go. 5.6. Sounds pretty cool. Okay, let's grab the camera. And of course we're shooting into Lightroom, so if any week we'll go to picture in picture with me large. Okay, 5.6. And of course 125th of a second. And let's just take the first shot and let's see how wonderful, amazing and terrible this will be. Okay, now if you look at the image, it's not that it's a bad image. It's not a terrible image, but it's an image where you go like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we're gonna watch this live stream because this looks absolutely horrendous. And you are absolutely right. So what's wrong with this image? The first thing is depth. There's no depth in the image. Of course we have a little bit of a shadow on the back, but it's not really something that we love to see as in depth. So let me first explain what is depth. Depth is actually created by using shadows. So if I use only one light source, I have to make sure of course that I see those shadows correctly. When I look at this, it's okay, but it's not the kind of shadows that I want. So let's make her look that way. And let's see what happens there. It's a little bit better, but it's still something where you go like, I don't know. 
it's it's okay, right? It's nothing more. Okay, let's try something that is actually something that is theory from lighting. Now, light falls off over the distance, so that means that if I move my model closer to the light, she will get more light on her face, but the backdrop will get less light, because the distance between my model and the background becomes bigger, and the distance between my model and the light becomes smaller. Let's just try it out. Can you move all the way to the front? There we go, that's awesome! And let's re-meter. Now, we still take 1.5 meter distance, dus sorry as ik wat afstandelijk ben. That was Dutch. It's a really funny joke. At least I think. Oh, let's turn it on. Yep. yep. We went from 5.6 to 5.67. Well, that's actually pretty much. So let's go down. There we go. That's 5.6 again. Okay. And now look at the backdrop. Totally different backdrop. Much more interesting probably, but also a little bit darker. And now for the first time you're going to see a little bit of a vignette on the back. And that's because I'm actually using a grid in the flesh. So let me turn that towards you guys so you guys can actually see what's going on. I'm using a grid inside my softbox, so that means that I really channel that light towards my model. But yeah, when I look at the image. Oh, yeah, of course I can turn it again. So, now you can see the grid? Yeah. Yep, okay, cool. But when I look at the image, I still go like, mm, I don't know, I need a little bit more depth. Okay, cool, let's move the light to the side. So, now by using light from the side, we are making a very, very dark side and of course a more a lighter side. So, where does she look? Of course, towards the light, right? Because if she looks the other way, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, I'm not going to re-meter. I'm going to guesstimate it. Okay, look that way, please. Perfect. Now what you see is the start of a little bit of a Rembrandt triangle here. It's not there yet, but it becomes there. But also the backdrop becomes a little bit nicer, a little bit cleaner. And what you actually can see is the start of a little bit of chiaroscuro. Now what is chiaroscuro? It's light, dark, light, dark. Now as you can see here, the right side of the image is a little bit darker, the model pops out, then her face becomes dark, and then the backdrop becomes light again. That creates way more depth and tension in the shot, which I really like. Let's push that even further by getting this light source and moving it all the way to the side. There we go. Is everything going okay, Annemiek? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, can you look all the way there? Perfect. Okay, look at the difference. Because now we are getting probably that Rembrandt triangle. Yep, there it is. And in all honesty, with this kind of shot, I would probably prefer to have one light on the back, just giving it a little bit of a kiss of light. But in this case, it's okay. Let's add a little bit more feathering to make the backdrop a little bit darker. Add a little bit of exposure on the strobe. And there we go. Uh, it's still, for a one light setup, it's okay, but it's nothing spectacular. You need something a little bit more, right? And although with the Rembrandt triangle it's cool, this really works best when I do it in portrait. So look all the way there. Perfect. So the whole body, no, or three quarters, but in portrait, well, probably yes. Like it. So what if, I what if we want to show a little bit more of the body? This is where we can actually move the light further away and we start adding a vignetting on the backdrop. So let's try that. Try not to hit you. Okay, now I'm placing it right in front of my model, a big no-go because that's very flat light, but I'm going to do something else. I'm going to take the light meter off first. I'm actually going to turn this all the way up. I'll move it all the way up, sorry, and aim it down. Are you afraid? Mm -hmm. Not yet. <coughs> Say not yet. <laughs> Are you afraid now? Always. It's becoming, right? <laughs> okay, I'm not going to meter, I want to take my distance a little bit. So normally, of course, in normal situations you meter every single shot, otherwise you have slight differences in exposure. Not a good thing. In this case, we need to do it. 
And now by placing the light on top, a little bit like an umbrella aiming down, I have a really nice vignette on the backdrop. And my model is nicely lit. Maybe the vignette a little bit more like this. Nice, okay, some cool poses because now I can actually do three quarters, look at this. That's awesome. And this is what I meant with the frustrating part of having two strokes, one on the back and one on your model. It will never function right. By doing this, it actually does. And even when I move around, I can play with that shadow on the backdrop. Look at this. I can make it dark on one side, light on the other. Or if I move this way, I have exactly the same effect because the light is in the middle. So this gives me a lot of play room to experiment with a lot of different looks from my model, but also a lot of different ways of shooting it. Nice! Love it! And the more I'm close to my strobe, the more she's in the center, the more I move to the side, the more she's out of the center. So it's a really easy way of understanding lighting. Uh, oh yeah. Chin down just a little bit. There we go, that's awesome. So, oh, okay, they took a little bit of while to get in, but you get the idea they will come in slowly now. I will go through the images in a second, so don't worry. Okay, so as soon as the images are there, you can see that we now have that nice vignetting on the backdrop. Now, of course, I can ask my model to move just a little bit that way. Perfect. Place her in front of another area of my backdrop, or move a little bit that way. Place her more in the middle. And move a little bit that way. Perfect. Stay there. That's perfect. And f especially that last one, she's dead centered. So this is too much to the right. That last one, she's dead centered. And as you can see, there's no shadow on the backdrop. The shadow is totally gone. There's a little bit of shadow on her side, but that's actually in the backdrop. So let's ask our model to step away. So you can see that that's in the backdrop. You see? That's part of the backdrop, so that's not a shadow of the arm. If the image comes in, of course, one day. There we go. Okay, so by placing our model in the center, we can create a nice vignetting. Does it also work for portraits? Yes. Even for portraits. Only with portraits, I have to be honest, when you see the image coming in. It's a little bit too much for me white on the sides. It's a little bit too bright. You don't get that nice vignetting effect. So for this setup, I would really advise you guys to move back, zoom out, and really capture that model in her hole. And then, of course, on the backdrop. So yeah, I really like that. Three quarters, great for me. Um, let me see, can you cross your arms? Not meer zoals op school, juist. Cool. Look at me like you hate me. With all those strokes you probably do, so. Okay, look in the camera lens. There we go, awesome. Chin just a little bit that way. Oh, that's nice. Cool. Okay, so this was with the 90 centimeters. I'm gonna look very quickly at the shots with you guys to see what we've done, because they come in a little bit slow. And then we're actually gonna switch over to a beauty dish for a totally different look. Same backdrop, totally different look. But stay online, because after that one, we're actually going to freak out with different backdrops. And we're going to use a backdrop which you probably never guessed. So that's going to be fun. Okay, let's first go to the computer and let Anoik set up the one with the uh, beauty dish. Very nice. Okay. Uh, let me switch back to my camera. Okay, so when we look at the images, um, they did come in a little bit slow, sorry for that. Uh, let me first move this out of the way. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this was actually what I meant by placing the model dead centered. And you really get that nice vignetting around our model. So this is really, really nice. Let's change the camera just a little bit. Okay, so what can you do with an image like this? Well, you don't have to do a lot. In all honesty, when I go to develop, I mostly use presets. And you might wonder like, Frank, presets, really? Yeah, why not? And nowadays, Photoshop and Lightroom are on the iPad. And one of the things that I really loved about 
Photoshop, of course, on the computer were all those plugins. For example, DxO Film Pack. You had uh, Exposure Software, previously known as Alien Skin Exposure, one of my favorite all-time tinting images. But overall, they only run on the desktop, not on an iPad. So I was thinking about, okay, let's try something to do with the iPad because I really want to do it. And I started to use the develop module more and more. And then you find out that it's actually incredibly, incredibly powerful. For example, the first thing you can do is of course go into presets. Like for example this, or booster reds, or whatever you want to do. But those presets are predetermined by me. So you can buy those presets, but hey, it's not what I want to show now. So let's first close the presets. Now, when you go to develop on the right side, that's actually where it's more interesting because here you can set up everything. Now, the first thing that a lot of people forget is that you nowadays have profiles. Now, in the past, those profiles were very important, for example, for color profiling, for your uh, color checkers, for your gray tuck bed charts, whatever you want to use. But mostly they were used to make a nice combination of your colors so that everything fits in that color space. So a lot of people just leave those and they just use a color checker and they upload it and done. I highly advise you, however, in the new Lightrooms to really go into profile and go into browse because there are some really cool surprises there. Now go down. And here we go, you have modern and vintage. Now I love the vintage ones and the modern ones also, by the way. So let's first start off with something. So for example, let's stir, uh, start off with vintage two. Nah. Oh, I really like this one or this one. Hmm, let me see. Vintage eight, yes, why not? That looks really nice. Okay, so that's one. Now let's go down. And now the cool thing about presets, or in this case profiles, is that everything else you can still do. So normally when you run a preset you will see that your brightness is changed, your contrast is changed, and everything is changed. When you use the presets like this, nothing changes. Look at this, everything is exactly the same. So everything is zeroed out. So that means that now I can start working with my image. So first, I, I'm not going to crop it now, or maybe I do, why not? Let's just crop it. There we go. Of course also the sides on that side, so let me just first unlock that. I, I never do it in one certain um, aspect ratio, but hey, that's me. Unless of course it's for print, then I use the 4x3 or 3x2, whatever they need. Okay, let's start out with some, yeah, let's start out with some contrast. There we go. Let's lower the highlights just a little bit. It's not a little bit, as you can see here. Now, of course, in the past, I used a lot of curves for tinting. So you can, for example, do the reds in the shadows a little bit less, in the highlights a little bit more. And this will get you a nice, like almost like a cross-process effect. And you can do the same thing with blue. But let's say that we don't want that. So let's start out with settings, everything again to zeroed. Okay. Now, besides the profiling and your curves, there's another option which I love to use. And that's actually under here, under your color. And that's called color grading. Now we have two options in color grading. One of course is the HSL, which we all use, the U saturation and luminance. That's the one where you can do for every color, you can change your saturation, your luminance, and your U. We probably all know that one, right? That's not rocket science. But this one is very, very interesting. Now I have to be honest, I'm running on a very low resolution now, so that's a little bit Let's give it a little bit more space. Okay, um, the first thing is the midtones, or the shadows, or the midtones here, or the highlights, or global. And this is very important. What I do is I will literally always start with the shadow. So the tree on top, if you scroll down, you can actually see that they're here. Some people really like it to have the tree together. I don't. So what I do is I first focus on my shadows. Now in this case, I want a little bit of brown in my image. So I'm going to go for brown. And I think this is okay. Okay, now I can still move this around if I want. Well, let's say I'm, I'm fine with this. Okay, then let's go for midtones. And midtones, we want to do a little bit towards blue maybe. 
not too much, just give it a little bit of a, a cooler tint. And of course now we want to do the highlights. And let's go all the way. Let's make that a little bit more vintage. And there we go. So now I've done the same thing with color grading, which in my opinion works way better than the curves. Now of course we can still do sharpening, which I never do. But I do use a lot of texture and clarity, of course, in my images. So let's go for there. Let's give a little bit of texture and a little bit of clarity. There we go. Now, normally when I do texture and clarity, let's clear that up. <laughs> what I always do is I do that with selective adjustments. So I will literally just paint the whole area uh, with selective adjustments. So let's do that for now. Um, yeah, yeah. Of course, we do a brush. Uh, let's make it a really nice a big brush. And of course first it's set up for uh, exposure, which we don't want of course. There we go, but we want to have clarity and, and texture, so let's bump that up even more. Okay, so now on the backdrop let's say that you like it. I don't, but hey, let's say. The only thing I now have to do is switch over from my brush to my eraser. And at that point I can take it out, so you can literally just subtract. So, it, it just depends on what you want and how you want to do it. For me, yeah, that's one of the options that you can do. And this is something that I normally did in Photoshop. So with layers, you make a layer mask, you enhance the heck out of one layer, and then you take it out with the eraser. Nowadays, you don't have layers in Lightroom, but you have something that comes really, really close with adjustments. And especially those local adjustments are really, really close. You might call it layers, although it's more like the adjustments that you do on a layer, but hey, it's, it works like a charm, as you can see here. Okay, so again, the shadow over here, because some people might think that's the arm, but that's really not the shadow. And overall, as you can see, when you zoom out, or zoom in, sorry, you, you miss that vignetting, so it doesn't have that impact. When you zoom out, it really, really shines. Okay, now for the next setup, we are going to the Beauty Dish. That's a totally different modifier. It's more powerful, it's way more contrasty. And I think that's going to be really interesting. But first we're going to do some uh, questions. Uh, let me see, nice picture of the model, thank you. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, what kind of diffusion is in the softbox? Okay, in the softbox there's actually only, uh, what I do is, I will probably in most deep throats, I will only use the front diffuser. Now there are mostly in those deeper octas, there are two diffusers, one in the middle, one in the front, sometimes even three. Experiment with this. Over time I found out that I like my images a little bit more crispy, so I often leave out one diffuser, so I only use the front one. In all honesty, I don't even know how the 90 is set up from Hensel, but you can experiment with it. That's the cool thing. A lot of people get those softboxes in, they see two or three diffusers, and without even thinking, they just kind of place in the first one, the second one, the third one, done, and we are shooting. Oh man, I really don't like this softbox, it's way too soft. I wish it was a little bit harsher. Let's sell it again. No, take out one of the diffusers. If it's still too, too soft, take out two of the diffusers. In fact, in the past we had a softbox where there was a diffuser in the middle and I actually took off the front diffuser. So you had the strobe, one diffuser, the throat of the softbox, and then nothing. So it just sent out. I really love the crispiness of that shot. So yeah, it's all depending on what you guys want. Use your lighting in the way that it's designed or do it your own way. Okay, um, let me see. We have the beauty dish set up. We have a new model. Totally new. So let's shoot some images. Are you ready? Yeah. Awesomeness. Okay. Um, you can stand in front. Let me see where my trigger is. Yeah, same uh, backdrop. There we go. Okay, beauty dish. A totally different modifier. Way more powerful, way more crispy. Need to have it a little bit higher for my taste. There we go. And we have another uh, movie star. 
Now, with a beauty dish, I love to have it straight from the front, right? Nothing in the world can beat a beauty dish straight from the front, like an almost butterfly lighting. Oh, I love that. And especially when they have sunglasses. Oh, yes, that's cool. Okay, move a little bit more forward. I have to find the light meter. Don't know where I left that one. Yeah, I see it on a week. I have it. I have to buy some of those whistle things where you whistle and they whistle back. So, oh, that's the dog. Sorry. Okay, let's meter. 2.88. Okay, let's go up. One, two. So that should be F4. That's the nice thing about a light meter. It's very, very fast. Okay, the beauty dish. Oh, this is going to be fun. F4. Okay. Okay, look straight at me. Now, as you can see, this is a totally different light source. Way harsher, way more straight right in your face. If the image is coming, there we go. But I still think we can do a lot better than this. Of course we can. Shoot it straight on. There we go. Chin down just a little bit to take out the reflection in the glasses. Uh, cross your arms again. Chin down. There we go. This is awesome. Now a lot of people ask me about those reflections in the glasses. How the heck do you get them out? Sometimes you don't want them out. Sometimes you want them in. For the very simple reason, they look cool. Now in this case, we don't really like the reflection, so the only thing you have to remember is angle of incidence is angle of reflection, or angle of reflection is angle of incidence. I always mess those up. What happens is follow the lines. If I want those reflections in, the only thing I have to do is raise your chin. There we go, look at that. And there we have the reflection. Move a little bit that way. And there we even have two. Now, the cool thing is, you can see this through the lens. There's no reason why this should happen by accident. You look through the lens, you see the reflections. If you don't want those reflections, chin down and aim your camera maybe slightly up. So, chin down. I can now see the reflections in my camera, so stay that way. Now I have the reflections. Now when I move my camera up, 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 up. At one point, there we go, now they're gone. So, it means that the angle of incidence is the angle of reflection. So here you see the image width, then I went all the way up with my camera, and look at that, now it's gone. So I have to find somewhere in between where I really like it. So can you tilt your head just a little bit, chin down, chin down, 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 stop. Love it. Look a little bit that way, straight into the camera, chin down just a little bit. Awesome, chin up just a little bit. There we go, I love it, just a little bit on the side of the glasses. Nice. Can you point towards the lens and make a big scream? One, two, three, go. So with sunglasses, somehow I always want my model to be a little bit edgy. So when we get the image in, of course, the hand in front will be really dark because it's out of the light, of course. That's where we need a second light or a reflector. But it just gives you a really, really cool look. Again, sorry that the image is coming so slow. As mentioned before, we do have some technical issues which we are working on. Audio already has been solved. Hey, this is weird. Okay, do it, ag do it again if you want. One, two. Okay, let's try that. Okay, let me see if that works. Ah, there we go. So it, it's just fun, you know, it's just working a little bit with your model. Okay, but that beauty dish, can you also use that from the side? Yes, but I have to warn you guys, because we're using a grid on the beauty dish, the light source will be a little bit tight. So let's just move it to the side and let's just show what happens. And the nice thing about beauty dishes and grids is that I can now probably make my background disappear. Or almost disappear. My model not. No? No. Nah. Okay, just look a little bit down. Now as mentioned before, I'm not going to re-meter, which I should. Nice. So as you can see here, it's really, really dark on the edges, but somehow I also love this look. So let's wait for it to come in. But this is more like a portrait, I think. Okay, look all the way there. I think when you do this really close up, you get some really interesting shots. So let me see from closer. Yeah, look at that. That's really nice. Okay, look all the way down. And also, I love the blue in her hair. So let's see if we can enhance that just a little bit. There we go. Okay, 
So normally I crop off really tight on the face or on the head, but because she has this really nice blue hue in her hair, I'm actually not going to do that. I'm going to show a little bit more of the hair because I love that blue. But now in all honesty, it might be a little bit too dark. So take the grid off. This is something that hardly ever happens in my studio, but we are going to do it now. We're going to take the grid off. Oh my, this is terrifying for me. Shooting without a grid. Oh. And the reason I'm always shooting with a grid is because I don't want my light to spill out everywhere. Now, of course, this is a running gag because without a grid, it only gets easier, right? Or does it? Yes and no. Now, if I really like that really tight light, like I showed you on the image that you see now, I really need that grid because otherwise the light will go everywhere. But sometimes you like that really tight look, but you also want some light on your backdrop. Okay, you can do that by using a sandwich technique. So I'm going to aim this at my model. I'm going to move it a little bit to the side of my model and I'm actually going to aim it not forward. Let me just first do it forward so you can see the difference. Okay, look that way a little bit. Nice. Oops, <laughs> getting a lot more light now of course. So let's just raise my aperture a little bit. Okay. It's actually okay. Okay, this is with the light totally turned away from the backdrop. As you can see, with the grid, I had it way more aimed at the backdrop, and I still didn't get any light without the grid. I now aim it mostly at the front, and I still get a lot of light on the backdrop. This is why we use a grid. When we don't use a grid is when we want that light on the backdrop. So let's change the lighting setup and incorporate that backdrop. So let's first make that hair really shine. So let's go to 7.1, I'm going to guesstimate it that way. Oh, that's nice, I don't have to say anything, she's perfect. There we go, so now we have something on the backdrop and we have something on our model. The nice thing about this setup is now I can start moving my light around. I can literally determine how much light on the backdrop, how much light on my model. If I want more light on the backdrop, I'm simply going to aim it more towards the backdrop. I'm going to open up my aperture just a little bit, let's say to 5.6. Look that way, perfect. Love it. And now I have way more light on my backdrop and the same on my model. So I can literally determine my light on the backdrop, my light on the model, as you can see in this image. Yeah, sunglasses, really love them, but here they are too dark. So let's fix that. Take them off, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, look towards the light if you want. <laughs> Cross your arms, chin down just a little bit, there we go, chin down just a little bit more, chin down just a little bit more. Now I take several shots, one with the strobe totally in, one with a little bit less and one only with the edge and you will probably see them coming in now. So this is with both, now just lower your chin just a little bit and then you only have one. And then in the end, I let her lower her chin even more, and I think this is the final one. Now, the thing is, you never know how much of that sunglasses you want in. Maybe you, you think at the moment that you shoot, black is cool. And then you come home and you go like, oh my, it's totally black. It's like there's nothing there. And that little bit of light on the top of that sunglass, that will literally give away, oh, she's wearing sunglasses. So it can make a huge difference. Now, let's just move the light a little bit more forward and just aim it a little bit more on a model. This is more like a realistic setup and look that way. Awesome. So I think this will give a way nicer balance. And of course also on the sunglasses, I can now see on both sides, I can see a little bit of that light. So let's see the image coming in. There we go. So this is way better for me. Post. So let's go. That's why I love the light meters. But I do want to take my distance if it's not necessary. Okay, chin down just a little bit. Nice. And of course I can move around myself, around my model to get different looks on the backdrop or maybe a little bit more contrast. Or maybe a lot more contrast. It's all very, very easy to understand and to do. As, mo as soon as you move away or you turn around your model, you're actually shooting into the light or back from the light. So pretty easy. Okay, um, we're going to go through the images and then we're going to set up the strip light. A totally different light source, different possibilities. 
So Annemiek, are you ready to set up the strip light? Do you think? I don't know, I don't know why Lightroom is so slow. Um, let's just first go through the images. Okay, uh, let's also switch over to my camera, that's a little bit easier to see. Um, okay, so most of the time when I shoot something like this, I really like to go for black and white, so a really powerful Contrasty images, almost like boom, and there you go. And with black and white, guys, listen to me, come closer, come closer. Don't be afraid to overdo contrast. That's black and white, contrast. So if you see something like this, a lot of people will start out with this. and go like, oh, nice and contrasty. No, black and white, one, two, three, boom. There's only one setting on contrast, for, and I'm just kidding. There are, of course, a lot of differences in between, but when I shoot something like this, I really like that high contrast look. Almost like the Matrix, only then in black and white. Doesn't make any sense, right? Okay. So, okay, let's see if I have the difference here. You see, this was the shot where we talked about those lights in her face. So here we have them two, one, a little bit, two, and none. So you see me experimenting a lot with poses in the head, up, down a little bit, and this means that I can always choose. And now comes the kicker. If you like this shot, if you go like, oh, this is the shot, Frank. Man, I'm in love with this shot. Oh, I love those reflections, but the shot just sucks. Photoshop, take the reflections from this shot, put it in that shot. Now I'm not gonna promote this for the very simple reason. I'm one of those guys that think that a photograph should be 100% straight in camera correct, but that will never happen of course. There's always something that you have to change. But with reflections, that's why I shoot different shots. But then still it can be that one has the perfect expression, the other one is nah, okay, then go for the one that's perfect and just take everything that you like from the one that's nah, into the one that's perfect. Hey, that's Photoshop, right? Layers, we love them. Okay, but let's see if we can make something like this, like black and white, look at this. And this is so powerful and cool when you bump up that contrast. Um, oh, not selective, sorry. Let's just go for contrast, like bump that up all the way. There we go, look at this. And you can even overdo it by going into curves and then going into all curves. Uh, sorry, edit and do. Of course we want to have all curves and then just bump it up even more. There was a question on Facebook. Oh, I will do the questions in a second. There you go. So it just depends on what you like. This is a little bit too much for me, but hey, okay. Yes, question on Facebook. The question was, uh, Frank, would you use a reflector under the model with the beauty dish above? Okay, would I use a reflector underneath the model with the beauty dish from above? It really depends on your personal preferences. There is no right answer. This is art, right? Art, okay. This is something that we create, so let's call it art. So what you can do is, of course, use reflectors to open up the shadows a little bit. What I found out that I'm really drawn towards those really, really harsh and deep shadows. So somehow I don't mind if something goes completely black. And a lot of people do. They go, oh, there has to be some detail. They go over like with the point to go like, oh my God, that's, oh, it's very close to one. I'm gonna panic. It's 1%. Oh no, it's 1%. I'm gonna, no. 1% or zero is great, why not? Let's make something 100% black, doesn't matter. As long as it looks nice. Now, of course, it's not the idea of just go, oh, Frank said it, so let's make everything. Let's first start with white. Okay, Frank told me to do it extreme, so let's go. Oops, <laughs> I hate lower resolutions. There we go, great, Frank told, no, this is wrong, right? This doesn't compute, this is, oh no. Maybe if you make it black and white, add a lot of contrast and noise. Hmm, okay. <laughs> Goes to say everything in black and white looks better. But you saw what I mean, right? That's over the top. But that totally black, that isn't really bad. But in color, somehow that doesn't work and you go, ooh, black and white, nice. And you see that it looks like it's almost lit up a little bit and that's because with black and white, 
you don't have the saturation. You only have luminance and U. And that's why you see the black and white mix. Now, the black and white mix is something that a lot of people don't use in black and white. But it's so important. Did you ever hear about the story that if you shoot black and white, your makeup artist should do something else? Like for example, the red lips, they will turn black? Yes, that's what you can do with your black and white mix. So let's say that we have some reds in here. And I want to open up a little bit on my image. Do you see that I can do that with the black and white mixer? Now, it sounds a little bit weird and a little bit off, but <laughs> I actually use the black and white filter, uh, the black and white mixer to add some light sometimes. For the very simple reason that sometimes I find that something needs a little bit more light or a little bit less. And I will just look at the backdrop. I will just do it like this. There's no green in here, so that will hardly do anything. Oh, there's a little bit in her hair. But aqua in her hair, see, just on top a little bit. Blue on the backdrop. Oh, let's make the backdrop darker. So as you can see, with your channel mixer and with your black and white converter, you, you can do so much. And that's one of the main advantages, I think, nowadays, also with Lightroom. It's not that... Let me put it this way. I recently talked to somebody about Lightroom and he immediately said, a professional using Lightroom? Oh, stop, Frank, you're not a professional. I was going like, okay, I'm not a professional. Great, why? He said, Lightroom is for suckers. Lightroom is for my mom and dad. And I go like, when is the last time that you opened Lightroom? He said, well, as soon as they changed to Creative Cloud, I didn't do a... I said, so you're running a Lightroom from before Creative Cloud? He said, no, actually two generations before. I don't even know the number of Lightroom, but let's put it this way, it was an old one. So I told him, do you know in the new Lightroom we have channel mixes, color grading, local adjustments, and he was going like, yeah, sure. I don't understand that people don't keep updated with software that they use. So in other words, his Lightroom, if he would update it, his vision would be totally different. Two years ago, I wouldn't take the iPad Pro seriously. Now it's my main workhorse. So one thing guys, if you know that something sucks, like Lightroom in the past for professionals, it was more where my images lived, but I couldn't do anything with it. The raw converter was okay, but for example, Capture One in my opinion was way better. But we are going ahead in time and Adobe does a lot of work in fine tuning those engines. I, I recently got a new update. It helps me uh, in performance of my, um, um, how do you call it? Of my um, catalog. And in all honesty, it is indeed 25, 30% faster. It feels faster when I browse through my images. So every time it's updated. So when you have an older version, you go like Lightroom is slow, try the new version. If you have the Creative Cloud and it's slow, one tip, put your catalog on an SSD drive and put your drive or your files on a spinner. Doesn't really matter. Your images, they don't ever get accessed, only when you retouch them. So on the SSD, you have your catalog. And in all honesty, I have in my catalog at the moment uh, 60,000, uh, 602,000 images. So, and it runs like crazy. The only thing is with tethering, we now have some slowdowns and I don't know why. Hey, that happens. Uh, let me see, there's another question. Um, Joost Bosman, why not use non-lights instead of gels? Yes, um, non-lights or any LED tube uh, can do colors nowadays, or not all, but most. And they are really great. And we are going to do a live stream soon where we combine strobes with gels, uh, sorry, with LEDs. Uh, we actually planned that yesterday, so you are going to see one of those. The reason I'm not going to do it today is, first of all, I am limited to only using one strobe. So I can't do that today. The other thing is, you have to realize that LED lights compared to strobes is no competition. It's like David versus Goliath, but then the other way around. It's like an ant versus an elephant. So when I use my strobes and I only use the modeling lights, I already sometimes have a little bit more light output than a colored LED. If I put my modeling lights on the lowest setting, I often have less light than my LED. So in other words, I could combine my modeling lights with an LED, that's no problem. But as soon as I use my strobes, it's 100 times more light. So it will literally blow away all the LEDs. Now there is a certain way that you can use this and we're gonna talk about that in a future episode. Use strobes that have a lot of f-stops or really low wattage, for example, 100 watts, or my strobes like 500 watts with six or seven stops of distance between the lowest and the highest setting. Put it on the lowest setting. Use something with a lot of diffusion, for example, a strip light with a grid. 
uh, sorry, with a lot of uh, sucking power, let me put it that way. Some modifiers will suck the power out of your strobe, another one like a 14 inch reflector will give you more power, but a strip light with a grid will literally limit your power output. So the lower setting on the strobe, strip light with the grid, maybe feather it away a little bit, and then with a longer sh shutter speed you can combine LEDs with your strobes. But we're going to do that later, but that's to answer your questions. So that's why we don't do it now. But I am going to use a, a gel today, it's slightly different than you might expect, but we are going to use it and because we're only using one light source, I have to be creative because I want two lights in my setup with only one light. So I want one light that is actually a little bit blue and one light that is normal. So how are we going to solve that? You're going to see that very soon. Other questions? Um, how to prevent that there is too less information in the blacks? Um, just look at your monitor. If you think it's right, it's right. If everybody tells you it's wrong, yeah, it's probably wrong. And then calibrate your monitor. If three people tell you it's right and two people tell you it's wrong, then it's right. You have to really, as soon as somebody says it's right, it's probably right, but it's not everybody's taste. Now, when I started photography, I really wanted to be an everybody pleaser. So I wanted my images to be like, everybody who saw my image going like, wow, that's a great image. And I found out that my images became more boring and even more boring to a point where it was so boring that I would rather read the dictionary than look at my own images. So what was going on? Some people liked contrast, some people liked open images. So what do you do? You use a big softbox and you try to incorporate some contrast by using side lighting or anything else, but still. Some people liked a very bright backdrop, some people liked darker, so what do you do? You try to combine it. The images become so much focused on what everybody likes that you lose the interesting part of your images. And at one point I just said, you know what, just, I'm going to do what I like. And that meant that I literally started using one light, very, very dark shadows, almost to zero, highlights almost to 254, and I just loved it. I posted it online and literally nobody loved it. It was, oh Frank, this is terrible. But this was on a website where most people were shooting with big softboxes. I didn't do that. So I tried to find more websites where they were more into the high contrast stuff. And I found out that those people said, oh man, I really like those shots, but I don't like the older stuff. And at that point I said, okay, now I'm going to combine everything that I like. So I started using more strobes. So for a year I used a lot of one strobes and then I started adding more and more. The nice thing is because I started out with one strobe, in most of my images, I hope at least, you don't see, unless you're a photographer of course, then we see it, but you don't see obvious that there are multiple light sources. Of course, when I use backlighting you can see it, but most of the time when we do those Rembrandt portraits with a little bit of accent light here, for most people they look at it and they go like, oh nice, how many lights did you use? And then when I tell two, wow, really? And then a photographer of course immediately sees that this has to be an accent light, but the fewer because we lower the output so much that it just looks a little bit open, they will just go like, wow, nice. So how much depth should you have in black? Should you see detail? If she's wearing a dress and you want there to be detail, show detail. If you think it's great by being total black, make it total black. There is no rule, it's art. Okay, uh, which SSD of the PC or external for the catalog? For your catalog, I would highly, highly recommend a Thunderbolt SSD. Now those are not cheap, those are literally expensive, but they are so incredibly fast and you can do a USB 3 also by the way, but don't go for an older SSD, just go for USB C or Thunderbolt. I don't know how much they cost, but um, I know my whole catalog is stored on, uh, let me see how big my SSD is. Uh, my SSD for my catalog is a 512, but it's only half full and yeah, most of that half is actually filled up by other stuff. So let me put it this way, if you buy, if you have a normal catalog, not 600,000 images, if you have a normal catalog, I think a 265 gigabytes SSD on USB-C will work fine for your catalog. Don't use the internal drive because the internal drive is also used for your software and the software is on there, so that doesn't really commute. And of course when you go to another computer you can just bring your SSD, plug it in and although you don't have your files there you can still do edits on the smart previews. So always make smart previews, that's the smart way to do it. Okay, we have the strip light set up. Uh, we're going to do a very quick commercial in between. Oh, Anna Week has a quick question. Can you tell us something about the background? 
Mm. Can you tell us something about the backdrop? Yes, I can. Let's just move up to a bigger camera for this because this is going to be an impactful one. I'm just kidding. So, when we were in uh, South Africa, I did a workshop and uh, one of the things that I needed was a backdrop. And I hate seamless. I don't hate seamless, but I love seamless, but I love to hate seamless because it's, it's seamless. So, uh, what is seamless, by the way, for people that don't know it, that's the normal colored or gray or white backdrop. So the paper backdrops, they call that seamless. And the thing about a seamless backdrop is that it's great, but it's also pretty boring. You can do some interesting stuff with it, but when I'm on location and when I'm somewhere in South Africa or in America, I want to make sure that I also show something of the area where I am. Now, in this case, it didn't really matter because it was a really boring place. But there was this trade show also going on. And there was this company from the UK called Click Prop Backdrops. Now, this is normally not my kind of cup of tea. But for the very simple reason, they have like this forest say, with smoke and everything. Like, yeah, it's nice for events photographers or for families. But when I do one shot with a forest, I'm done with the forest. Cut the trees down. Don't cut the trees down. I'm very much for environmental. But you know what I mean, right? Just throw away the backdrop. They also have a lot of backdrops that are a little bit more abstract. So like the one you see here, this is called the old tapestry, I believe. And we started talking with Charlie, he's the owner of Click Pro Backdrops, and we borrowed one of his backdrops because I wanted to see how the light hits it. Now, a lot of those backdrops are made from vinyl. And what you will see is that you get a lot of reflections back from your strokes. And that's something that I don't want. When I shoot something called old tapestry, I want to be able to aim my strobe right at it and I don't want to see the reflection of the strobes. Now, as you can see in the images <coughs> that came in, we don't have any reflections of the strobe. There's not a shiny place where the strobe is. Every other backdrop I tried, except the Lasto lights, by the way, they have that shiny backdrop. Now, the Lasto lights, that's, that's why I call them, Lasto lights are great. The only problem with the Lasto light for me is they have a limited width or height, and I always do them in the width. But still then, I can't do what I really want to do. I can do it on trade shows with portraits, that works fine. But if I want to do it in the studio, I'm very much limited by the size. They do have one that's a lot bigger. We actually have that in the studio. Let me switch over to that camera. It's the Kotak Tapestry. <coughs> oh, it's the Kotak Tapestry. So behind uh, the strobe, you see a brick wall that's actually wallpaper. And then next to it, you see the... Uh, how do you call it? The Lastolite um, panoramic backdrop. And that one is absolutely fun and amazing to use. I love it. It's one of my favorite backdrops. The nice thing about click pop backdrops is they are exactly in the middle. So they are really wide or small. You can get them in different sizes. But the vinyl where they're printed on is really, really good with reflections. And they have some really cool backdrops. So I fell in love with the more abstract ones, like letters and arrows and some old uh, walls. And eventually we started talking and we are the distributor in the Netherlands for ClickProp backdrops. So if you want a backdrop, you're in the Netherlands, just call us. We have plenty of those on stock and we also uh, have them in plenty of other sizes. And we have the Frangoria Yes, special. that's what I wanted to say. So as soon as we started using them and I was so enthusiastic, I said, why not make some that are from my studio? So we have all these walls in our studio that are painted, right? We have all these custom walls and a lot of people like them. And so we came up with this cool little one-liner like, hey, if you want me in your studio, that's not possible, but you can have a piece of my studio in your studio. So we actually have the Frank Doorhoff signature uh, uh, backdrops, as you can see here in the catalog. And the coolest part is actually this one. And this one is why it's so important that I tell you that story. This is the opulent red. And the opulent red, I can't show you now because it's over there and there's not a camera pointed at it. That thing stinks. It's terrible. It doesn't smell, but it's a terrible, terrible backdrop. And why is it? It's so cool, but I can't photograph it for the very simple reason. One of my interns painted it and they used the wrong paint. They used satin. And I told them, matte. And they, oh no, satin gloss. And they, they went like, you have 10% gloss and you have 100% gloss. I think they are at 99.9 plus zero one or something because it shines like crazy. So every time when I use that backdrop in a workshop, it's actually to tell people about the angle of incidence, how to get those nasty reflections out. So when we shot it for click prop backdrops, this is the cool part, I actually use my own click prop backdrops in the studio instead of the original backdrop. Because the one on click prop backdrops, I shot under a certain angle with light on it, like I never could do it in real life. 
Then we straightened everything up, used some polarizing filters on the camera also while shooting it, and it looks awesome. So now I look like, okay, I can never do that in real life with that backdrop, but I do have the same one in ClickPro backdrop. So the opulent red, if you're not in the Netherlands, order it online, then you're a part of our studio. And we have many others, of course. Okay, um, any more questions on Facebook, Annemiek? No, I answered them all. Wow, uh, can I have a little bit more to drink? Yes. Okay, let's switch over again to picture in picture. Let's walk into the studio. And let me just first, um, I want to try something. I hope you guys don't mind. Very quickly, let's close Lightroom. And let's do something else. I'm taking a risk now, but I think it will pay off. And otherwise I can always start Lightroom again. Um, Let's start up another software package, which is way faster with tethering. Okay. Okay, if it's only to see ca uh, images coming in, this will do just fine. It's now downloading from my card, so that's why it looks like crap. Okay, let's just. Okay, let's just try if this works better, otherwise we're just gonna go back to uh, Lightroom if it doesn't work. Okay, um, strip light. I would say go back. So, strip light, turn it on, that always works best. Now with the strip light, of course, I can still shoot straight from the front, which is eh, okay, but it's not really and that nice. Let's try it. 4.05. Let's go down one, two, three, four, five. So now at F4. Okay. Strip light straight from the front. Most terrible setup ever. F4. And there we go. A lot of backdrop noise, a lot of junk in the backdrop, like shadows. It doesn't really look nice. It's not something that's very appealing. How can you change it? Well, actually not, because this is how it is. Are you happy with that shot? I love your hair. I really love it. It's like aqua and, g and green and I did it myself. somebody it really nice with some spray paint. So we want to enhance that, of course. We want to make sure that she looks the part. Hmm. And this is where the strip light really comes in handy because the strip light, you don't have to use it like this. You can actually use it like this. Go really close to our model, aim it up, go really close, aim it down. And remember that light falls off over the distance. I now have it straight on her hair. That means that the hair will get everything, and then the face will slowly get a little bit less light. But what if I want the face a little bit more light? Watch this. There we go. Now we have the hair and the face. I'm not going to meter, which I should, and I'm going to regret this. I'm like a walking commercial for light meters. Okay, look that way. Uh, all the way down, like, yes. Chin down all the way, just look, yes, there we go. I really want to show off the hair. And as you can see here, it just looks way better when you let her look down. You really get that nice hair, but I would love the sunglasses back for a little bit edge. And in the meantime, I'm going to change something. Because I want to make that hair jump out even more. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to move my light a little bit here to make the backdrop darker. Because when the backdrop is darker, you will actually see that light hit it a little bit more. Oh, that was less light on a week instead of more. I want this a little higher. Oh, you want it a little bit higher. Okay. So that's Anna Week, in case you don't know. And that's Chewy, in case you don't see him. That's our dog. Are you ready, Anna Week? Yeah. Okay. So I moved it a little bit closer. She was coming in going, where did I go? But I moved it a little bit closer towards me, a little bit further away from the backdrop. Look all the way down. And now the backdrop is a lot darker and I get a really, really nice oomph look. So I really like this. So let's work a little bit more with this. 
Nice, love it. And by moving around my subject, now because I have a strip light, I can literally do whatever I want. Maybe add a little bit of the light in, or maybe do it really, really nice and flat. How about this? Or maybe this. Ooh, chin down even more. Ooh, love this. This is awesome. Nice. But you know with strip lights, there's so much more you can do. There's so much more that's exciting. Because a strip light is, I think, the perfect light source. It's the light source that is really narrow and also really tall. So that means that you can literally have a little bit of light on a big subject, but still no light spill. So let's stand all against the backdrop. Literally against the backdrop. Let's first do this. Gonna aim it like this. And we're gonna ask our model to look down again. I don't know why, but that just looks best with hair. So now I have a little bit of light on the backdrop, like a, f like a spotlight. I have my model there, and because it's shooting from the side, we don't have that shadow, that nasty shadow. Let's add a little bit less light on the backdrop. Okay, step one step closer. Perfect. And because she keeps the same distance to my strip light, if I would meter, I don't have to re-meter. The only thing I have to do is crop out a little bit of that strip light on the side. But you can do that easily in Photoshop. A little bit more light on the backdrop, no problem. Just aim the light. And again, you only have to crop out that little part of the strip light. Hey, but if this is possible, why not do something else? Now, you all know glamour photography, right? Bodyscapes and those beautiful, beautiful curves and whatever. But we're not going to do that today. What we are going to do today is actually show you the glamour lighting setup for that kind of shots. So I want you to move all the way to the backdrop. I'm going to place this light again in the normal setup, so like this. And really close to the backdrop. It's almost, the stand is almost hitting the backdrop. Now let's first see how it looks straight on. Okay, and look down again. Cross your arms. Awesome. You are bad. You know it. As you can see here, very, very powerful shot. I love it. There's a little bit of light leaking in her sunglasses, but that's okay in this case. Because it is a strip light. You can take it out by moving her chin even lower. But with a strip light, that's always a little bit tricky. But hey. <sighs> Frank, that's not a body paint. Oh, sorry, bodyscape. No, I know. With a bodyscape, what we do is we actually move all the way here. Okay, look all the way down. And I'm trying to shoot it with the strobe barely in the frame. So I'm going to do it like this. If you like the strobe, you can even do it like this. Or if you want it more in, why not do it like this? So there are many different options, but if you want it more flat, again, move here. Look here. No. Oh. Oh, I love it. Nice. Look all the way there. Chin down. More, 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 more. Yay! There we go. Great. Okay, so strip lights. Great, awesome. Let's do it one step further. Do you have something that's really etchy in your clothing? Uh, no. <laughs> no? Okay, um, then just something like this. That's great. Annemiek, if you can move the, that backdrop. So we're gonna move it. We're gonna move some stuff around in the studio. I'm gonna put on a commercial for you guys in between. It will be about one or two minutes, and then we will be back. So I'm gonna run to the computer for the commercial, and then we will be back in a few moments. Don't worry. <laughs> The Light of the Old Masters. Isn't that a great title? But what is it? Well, in the old days, we all know those pictures, right? Harcourt, George Harrell, film noir. It's that awesome look where you have total light control. Well, this video is all about total light control and mimicking 
the look of those old masters. But we're going to do way more because we are not in the old times anymore, of course. We are in modern times. So we're going to talk about using flex in a modern studio. Of course, combining continuous lighting with strobes for a film noir look. How to create those really nice harsh shadows on your model, for example, from blinds. And of course, how to get mood in your pictures. I'm going to share a lot of different tips to get a nice glow in your images without breaking the bank. We're going to talk about speciality lenses like the Lens Baby system. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff that really adds that magic of the old masters to your images. The video is available now and I'm 100% sure you're going to love it. It's very technical. But I'm very sure that even if you're a beginner, you get a lot of information out of it. But this is the video about total light control, glamour, the light of the old masters. Available now. Okay, now if you haven't seen that video yet, I highly recommend it. It's really awesome. I think it's one of the best ones that I ever did. So in that video, you already saw our um, Venetian blinds. I hope it's called Venetian blinds. We call it Yellow Sea. Um, what you can do with, of course, Venetian blinds is place your model behind it and shoot through it like you saw in the video, like a little bit of a film noir detective kind of look. But we were thinking about today about the digital classroom and that I can only use one light. And I was thinking like, okay, I want to do something with that backdrop and that vignette on the backdrop. So we already did that. But what if people don't have the money for click pro backdrops or seamless or whatever, and they want to do it with stuff that they can buy in any do-it-yourself store or, for example, at Ikea or whatever. Now, one of the things that I always do is I take my phone with me to, for example, a do-it-yourself store, and I will start reflecting on stuff. So I will put on the strobe and I will just go like, okay, how does this look? How, how? It, it looks weird, but nobody ever asked me about it. Maybe they think that... I escaped or something. But it looks weird, but it works like a charm. So everything that you have reflects light differently. Now, what you have to remember is that light really doesn't exist. Of course, we see it, and there are particles, protons or whatever, but light at itself isn't an entity. What we see is reflections. And something that is black doesn't reflect back anything. Something that is white reflects back a lot. Something that's middle gray reflects back, you guessed it, half. So when you have something as a backdrop that's highly reflective, you can get some really funky ideas, of course, because now the backdrop will shine up and you will get some really interesting shots. But is that really so? So, for the first time ever, so it could be that I make a terrible mistake, we recently bought new Venetian blinds. The old ones were uh, red and as a backdrop that didn't really work. These ones are highly reflective metallic. And I never did this before, so I'm very, very curious to see what happens. So you guys are with me for the first time ever. We're going to try to shoot Venetian blinds that are very reflective with only one light source. Where do I start? Okay, uh, first some questions to get some more into my head. Uh, where can you find those antenna pieces? I've seen them used on the set quite often. I love the lines they create. Antenna pieces. Hey, what is an antenna piece? I don't know. I think it's the... The looks of legs. No, antenna pieces. Okay, can you please email me what you mean with antenna pieces? Because I love the lines that they create. Or do you mean flags? But antenna pieces, I don't know what you mean. No, the flags are not in the frame. Yeah, and then another one says, Samsung makes great SSDs and GTEC makes good hard drives. Yes, GTEC I can highly recommend. La C is my personal favorite. I never experimented with GTEC, but I hear only positive things about it. But La C for me is the brand for the very simple reason, hey, we're Dutch and they make orange hard drives and you can drop them. So that's great for Anuik and great for me because I always drop them and Anuik loves orange. Or was it the other way around? I don't know. Everybody loves Rebecca's hair. Mm. They love it, yeah. Yeah, and if everybody loves it, it must be wrong, right? Okay, um, <laughs> okay, let's go. Okay, and anyway, I will switch over again to picture in picture. Okay, and there we go. Uh, okay, let's do the bigger picture in picture. I think that's better for people to see what I do in the studio. Or did you also use that one? No, I used the other one. Okay, the other one is too small. Oh, wow, love it. Are you going home? Ah, uh, not yet. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, let's see. I, of course, want to use the beauty dish for this. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that the backdrop really shines. 
So we're going to put a lot of power straight on our model. And instead of a shadow behind her, I of course am hoping on a big reflective part. And again, if it doesn't work, yeah. <laughs> That's a shame if it doesn't work. And we cut it out. But sometimes that can be the most fun. Okay, let's meet at the light. 4.03, one, two, three, let's go down. Okay, so that's F4. Perfect. Okay, now let's see what happens. Okay, Chewy, are you on the count? Chewy doesn't speak English, so I have to coach him in Dutch. Okay, chin down just a little bit. Ooh, love it. Got it. No, I'm just kidding. Let me add this a little bit further. Okay, so I like the effect. Let's add a little bit more power to the strobe. Let's over power just a little bit. Ooh, love it. And these are just very simple Venetian blinds, or I hope they're called Venetian blinds. Okay, you cross your arms. Love it. Nice. Okay, so this I really like. So what will happen if we start freaking out a little bit more? So now I get my confidence, because this works. Let's see what we can do with a little bit of side lighting. Are you in for this? Yeah. Nah. Yeah. Doesn't mean any. Yeah. Okay. That's the Dutch mentality. Okay, just look all the way down. Perfect. Maybe a little bit more from here to cut out that side. Ooh, this is nice. Open up. Again, normally use a light meter. Love it. This is cool. Okay, let's do it from this side. See if we can get the same power. Ooh, nice. I actually love all these shots. Chin up just a little bit. And again, I love her hair, so let's do a little bit more of that. Maybe something in the middle. Let's do this. Let's try to create like a streak of light behind her. Let's see if that works. Oh yeah, love it. Nice. Okay, but hey, um, if this works, yeah, let's try something else. Um, I hope I'm not going to regret this one. I'm going to take this and I'm going to place it behind you. All right. Ooh, this is going to be terrifying. And we didn't practice this, so let's hope it uh, does do what I think it does. Okay, so I'm placing it right behind my model, but still aimed down just a little bit. So let's just go up. You probably won't see me now anymore. No, only your feet. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. This is the best shot of me ever. Okay, let's open up. There we go. Okay, place the light further away. And let's see what we can figure out with this. Let's open it up a little bit more. Or a little bit less. Let's try this. Okay. I think we used it the other way around, Annabeek, the Venetian blinds, because I can only open them up on the other side. Yeah. But hey, this will work. So just to explain to you guys, the um, what I wanted to do was this, and then this way, for the lamels, I don't know how you call them, but I can only do this. So the light is actually going to be blocked. But for the idea, I think you're going to get it, I hope. Or at least I'm going to get it to see if this really works. Okay, so now behind my model I will only see my strobe, but that's correct. So I see the Venetian blinds, I see my strobe, but now what I want to do is I want to make sure that I see my model. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the volume, uh, going to turn up the volume all the way from the strobe. I'm going to literally go to full blast. There we go. Okay. Let's open up to 2.8, just to experiment. And let's see what happens. 
Cool. Okay, uh, can you look this way a little bit? There we go. Uh, all the way there. I think this works. Yeah, love it. Oh, very, very filmic. Okay, I need to open up even more. So let's go for ISO. Let's try 200. Why not? That's better. Wow. So she will be blown out just a little bit on the sides, but man, I love this shot. Can you turn around all the way and just look towards there? So also your body. There we go. Nice. That's the way. Awesome. So as you can see here, I'm using it from a totally different side. Now, even if you move that light further away, you can also get those little nice streaks on our body. In this case, we didn't um, because the distance and I can't use them the other way around, but it, it works. So this is a really cool thing to work with something that's really cheap and get some really cool, interesting effects. You can use it as a backdrop, you can use it as a side drop, you can use it actually to shine light through, you can make a storytelling part of it. For example, I could ask her, can you look outside, what's happening on the street? So just open them up with your fingers a little bit. Oh, sorry. Chin down, because you're looking down. Yes, there we go. So look at this, this is more storytelling. I could sit on the other side and look, but hey, I think this looks pretty cool. Let's make a few more to make sure that I nailed it. Nice. And especially in the glasses, I love that effect. Can you lower your hand? There we go. Ooh, this is really cool. Nice. Love it. Make it black and white, add a lot of contrast, instant art. Okay, um, we're going to remove this and then we're going to create something with a gel. But for that, we're going to need a little bit of time. So I'm going to start up another commercial and we're just going to take that away. And then we're going to prepare the gel and I'm going to show you how I do it. But uh, let's do that now. So let's first go for a little bit of a commercial. Hey guys, Frank here. I'm the author of Mastering the Model Shoot and you guys love the book because we get rave reviews and well, it's a very complete book, right? And what is the best thing to do next to the book? You have to see the stuff, right? So you can visit workshops or you can get instructional videos and that's actually what we are doing at the moment. We already released Mastering the Model Shoot video one, the light meter, everything about the light meter. After that, we released On Location with loads of tips on working on location. And that's one of the most challenging things because there's so much going on. And today, we are releasing video three, creativity. And this is one of the most asked questions. How do you get that creativity in your shots? How do you make sure that the images go from okay to wow? So in this video, we talk about everything, well, everything that's almost impossible because creativity is so incredibly big but in this video we're going to show you some really cool tips we talk about styling how about the photo shoot with jessica rabbit and that's not a joke how about smoke and gels how about working with a light blaster with different lenses lens flare breathing on the lens and there's so much more in this video so make sure you check out mastering the model shoot video 3 creativity Okay, so for the next setup, we're gonna do something that, again, I never did before. I'll, I did do it before, but not with one light, so I am pushing it a little bit. Um, oh, wait a minute, he means the antenna silo which are on our stage. Oh, those, uh, those are trusts and you can't buy them. Uh, we got them from, or you can, you can buy everything, but we got them from a friend of us that is actually owning a, a toy store and uh, you, you can buy them from stage companies. They use them to build stuff and to hang lights from. And we just got three, one small, one medium and one larger. And we sometimes use them in our studio as a backdrop. But he, officially there's not a store where you can just buy them as a consumer. You have to go to somebody that does, um, um, how do you call it, uh, beurswerken. 
Exhibitions? Exhibitions and sure. trade shows and that kind of stuff. So they are used for lamps. Okay, so what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to ask Anouik to follow me on the camera, but in big pictures. So not on picture on picture. And as you all know, we love flags. But I only have one light source now, and I want to do something with color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my two flags, and I'm going to place them high up. I'm going to lower this a lot. Let's see how far or how low I can get them. And I'm going to do the same thing with this one. And down. Okay. Let's move that one up. Cool. And let's just place those. Let me do it so you guys can see it clearly. There we go. Nice. So what I'm now going to do is I'm when I'm placing my light, I'm going to make sure that one of the lights or one of part of the light is actually going to hit my model from here and one of the lights is actually going through the blue gel. So we're going to fasten the gel. And Anouk, if you can help. I think this will be big enough. And then, yeah, no, a little bit higher. Yes. The more room I have, the better. Okay. Okay, this is what we call MacGyvering. Uh, uh, yeah. Instead of tape. Okay. And now let's take our light source. And let's just use, I think a snoot. I think a snoot will be fine for this. I just love the Hensel way of mounting accessories. Really handy. Okay. Anouik, pass up. Okay. And let's place the light here. Now it's very difficult for me to see what I'm doing due to all the lighting. But we're just going to try the best. I think this will actually be okay. If it isn't okay, I'm sorry, then I have to adjust it a little bit. Okay, Anouik, if you can go into big picture in big picture. Again, normally use a light meter, but because we want to take as much distance as possible, I'm not going to do that now. Uh, maybe move a little bit closer. There we go. Um, just going to guesstimate it, 6.3 maybe. Okay, there we go. That's too much. So let's go for 2.8. Okay, there we go. So now we have the bottom part that's actually very much distinct. You see that there's a distinct line between blue and the other one. Now, what if we don't want that? So let me first take a few images like this. Aha, uh -huh, battery exhausted. That's awesome, but not. Okay, so let me just explain, um, because now I can't, okay, that's terrible. Let's see if I have enough juice to get into the menu. Menu, USB power supply on. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so what if I want a little bit less of that blue on my model? So, uh, sorry, I don't want to... Now I totally lost my train of thoughts, I'm sorry for that. So now as you can see there's a distinct line between the blue and my model with the normal color. Let's see if you don't want that. The only thing you have to do is actually move this light closer towards the gel. So if you move it closer to the gel, and now of course I have to lower it, that's why we started out with a little bit higher. Can you see half of the strobe or more? 
you can see the whole strobe. <laughs> okay, let me see what happens now. Okay, let's go for 3.5. There we go. So now we have a little bit more of a softer edge transfer between the blue. But of course we want it a little bit higher. Oh, they don't come in anymore. Uh, okay. Let me make sure that they do come in. Oh, that's cool. That should work. Yeah, there we go. Okay. The stress, the stress. There we go. So now if it's okay, you can see that there's a little bit more of a distinct line. I don't know why. Annabeek, did you move anything? Don't touch the computer. One moment, guys. Okay, let me see where they are. Okay, let me see if the new ones now will come in. Technique. You can have the best story in the world, but if the technique doesn't work, that's the problem. Let me first make one of the floor. Yeah, no luck. Okay. Ah, I see the problem. One moment. It was still caught up in the buffer because the battery was exhausted. Okay. Final check. Anavi, can you please uh, pull out the uh, USB and back in again? There we go. Now it starts charging and it recognizes the camera. Okay, there we go. Let me see if it now comes in. Yeah, no such luck. Oh. Okay, guys, one more try. Final try. And otherwise I'm gonna start very quickly. We're gonna reboot um, Smart Shooter. One moment, guys. Can you grab my camera on the weekend? Try to make a picture when I say. Okay, let's close up Smart Shooter and let's open it up again. Okay, so there we have the computer part is now okay. Let's reboot the camera. Okay, we have an active camera. No. Anouk staat die aan, mijn camera? Yeah. That's weird. Zit the kabel erin? Okay. Uh, okay, can you try to make a picture? Okay, there we go. Awesome. Okay, so let's try that again. Sorry guys, that's a live stream. In case you didn't notice it yet. Yeah, I gaan maar. Okay, sorry, wrong screen. Sorry, guys. Uh, let me see. There we go. Okay. Now, if you think Frank looks 10 years older after this, you're pretty close. Okay, <laughs> let me try it again. Okay, so a softer transfer between. Did that come in? Yeah. Yes, okay, cool. So now I can use the strobes again. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now the transfer is a little bit softer, as you can see here. So the more I close that towards the gel, the closer, the softer. The further away, the harsher. So if we really want it nice and mixed, I can literally go really close up. And Aim it up just a little bit, I can now see it a little bit. And there we go. Let's just raise it a little bit to 
Again, light meters are better. Really nice. Okay, let's raise our Anoui. Can you help me a little bit on that side? Let's raise that up. Very careful. And stop. Cool. Let's try that again. Okay, a little bit lower, but we don't need it lower. I can actually raise my strobe. Just a little bit. I think we're getting there. Again, normally when the studio is dark, you can literally see what you're doing. It's a little bit difficult now. But there we go. Now we have something that I like. So now I'm using two colors with one strobe. Pretty nifty. There we go. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. You are ready. A big hand of applause for our beautiful model, Rebecca. Don't we just love her? Okay, let's go back here. Now, when you look at those images, and I'm so sorry that it went a little bit wrong with the live stream, but when you look at the first ones, you can see that we have a really distinct line. Uh, let me go to one of those images. There you go. It's like you see the normal lighting and boom, you see that, that line. And that's something that I really don't like. So by moving that light closer towards the gel, you are using the edge transfers. So normally when we use um, flags, we actually use them to cut off parts of our lighting, right? To make that really nice harsh light only on one part. Uh, when you look at the old glamour photography, George Sorrell, Harcourt, they all use that kind of techniques to really light something up and everything else is a little bit blurry. Now, a lot of people think those are strip lights and you can actually do it with strip lights, but flags are way more powerful. The reason is, if you use a strip light, let's say you wanna, you wanna light this part and then you want hard edge transfers. With a strip light, it's always a little bit soft. But let's say that you like it, but now you want it more or you want it harsher. That's not possible with a strip light. You can move it closer and further away, but you can never really control that edge transfer. And that's where flags come in. Flags are awesome for that. When you look at our uh, Light of the Old Masters video, you see one setup, and we actually filmed this also for photo facts in the Netherlands. So there will be a Dutch class called Light of the Old Masters in Dutch. So if you are a member of photo facts, you can watch it for free. If you are not, they are actually going to sell it separately. But hey, it's Dutch. If you want the English version, get Light of the Old Masters from our website. Okay, so when you move that light closer towards the flags, you will see that the edge transfer from that flag becomes softer and softer and softer. When you move it further away, it becomes harsher. And that's exactly what I'm using here. Now, is this something that you can use in your normal photography using split coloring like this? Now, I have to be totally honest with you guys. No. And yes, we've done this a few times before with Glamour Workshops where we did um, figure photography or bodyscapes with two gels, one red on top and one blue on the bottom or the other way around, I don't remember. And that, that looks absolutely awesome because you can then fade the difference between black, or sorry, between uh, red and blue by moving the strobe. So the strobe close to those two gels and you will have an almost like a gradient between red and blue. Move the strobe all the way to the back and you almost have like red, a little bit of both, blue. Now that's the technique I'm using here. Now the reason we're using it today here is to showcase two things. One, if you use a snoot, there's still light spillage. And what we actually do is by the two flags on the side, I'm cutting off all the light from the side. So of course you can have somebody holding up the gel, but then there will still be light going from the sides. By placing the light between those two flags, I'm actually cutting off the light with flags, so there's no light spillage. And by using a snoot, I have a very narrow beam of light, so I'm literally shooting through my flags and using the gel. I hope that makes sense for you guys, but in essence, when you look at the images, they, they speak for themselves. The more I move my light away from the gels, the softer, oh sorry, the harsher the edge transfer. So this was at the start. As you can see here, very, very harsh. And then at the end, it's almost faded out. So sorry I showed this a few times, but I know that this is very hard to see on a monitor, but it's, it's that soft edge transfer that I really like. 
Oké, okay, um, where to buy the blinds? Blinds, that's actually the correct term, I think, instead of Venetian blinds. Um, the blinds you can get in any store, so you can get them, uh, not any store of course, but you can get them at Ikea, you can get them at uh, Carvai. Yeah, I, I said it. Gamma, Praxis. 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 But how do you say it in English? Um, Building? Do it yourself stores. Uh, wherever you buy something for your home, do it just for your home. There's, I believe they're 25 euros or 30 oh, euros. Oh, a little bit more because this is a big one. Yeah, this is a big one, so they were a little bit more expensive. Like the, 50 euros. Like 50 euros. The first ones we got were a little bit smaller. Yeah, but they were pink. And they were pink actually and red. The color but they pink. were a little bit uh, smaller. And for what I did, now you can use the smallest ones because you're using them as a backdrop. But we also want to make sure that we sometimes shoot those um, hardcore images. Like, let, let me just show you very quickly. That is so much easier. Um, let me go to my portfolio. And then let's just drop that in here. And then when you go to fashion, we also did a lot of artist shots uh, with that look, but the first Venetian blinds, um, let me see if I have an image of that here. I think these were the first ones, yeah. So with these ones, I was actually on the edge, so I couldn't move around anymore. And that was very, very limited because although this shot looks great, I wanted to go more back. And that was not possible because, well, the Venetian blinds were too short. Now, when we got the bigger ones, that actually gave me way more options to shoot more full body like this or this. This could also be done with the smaller ones, by the way, but you get the idea, right? Bigger is better in this case. So that's why we use those. Okay. Um, any more questions? Um, where about the blinds we have? have we, do we have any questions on Facebook? No. Okay. We did start it about 20 minutes too late, so we did went a little bit over time now. For the next digital classroom, what are we going to do with the next one? It's uh, March 2nd and uh, it's the mobile workflow. The mobile workflow on March 2nd. So that's all about the iPad. Uh, I'm not going to do a model shoot there. We're going to use some images. We, we are. We are doing a model shoot. We are, we we are doing a model shoot. I invited Claudia. Ah, we do a model shoot with Claudia. And then right after the model shoot, we are going to retouch those images in Lightroom on the iPad Pro. So that's going to be awesome. I can already tell you that. Okay, uh, another thing. We started another... workshops again. Oh yeah, in the Netherlands, we did start our workshops again because they are letting go all the rules and regulations at February 25th, I believe. I do have my doubts about that. I'm totally honest with you guys. I think it's okay now with Omicron that there is less severe uh, consequences, but there could be another variant or whatever. So we still follow all the Corona rules. So that means that we stay 1.5 meter distance, even if it's not necessary anymore. So if you are planning on booking a workshop, but you are a little bit like, I don't know if it's safe, Trust me, with us it's 100% safe. We only do one workshop each week at the moment. So that means that we ventilate the whole studio before the workshop. We make it really hot and toasty in here and then we open up the doors during the workshop if necessary. So that means that we have a constant flow. We keep 1.5 meter distance. If you want to wear a mouth mask, you are more than welcome to wear a mouth mask. Of course, no problem at all. So the workshops in the Netherlands will start again starting next week. This week we don't do a workshop, next week we are starting again if we have enough uh, attendees of course. So make sure you check it out online. Uh, for the videos make sure you go to, of course, the videos part of the website. So that's frankdorf.com slash videos and there we have all those um, videos there like Light of the Old Masters, we have uh, street and travel photography videos and whatnot more. And the other thing I want to close up with is actually something, a message about Patreon. And we get so many cool responses on Patreon that I would highly recommend you guys. It's only one dollar a month or more if you want, but for one dollar a month you become part of a great community. You see separate videos for that community, a lot of behind the scenes uh, stuff, and of course a lot more. So let me just show you a little bit about Patreon and then we're going to close off Digital Classroom. If it works. Hey guys yeah. and welcome to our studio in Amaloid. My name is Frank Doroff and today I want to talk to you guys about something that we get a lot of questions about. Hey Frank, how do you like this image? Hey Frank, what can I improve in this image? And of course I love to help you guys out. But online I mostly am limited to just saying hey I really like it or 
continue like this or change this. I, I can only do short images because, let's be honest, we get so many questions. So that's what actually got us thinking. And we started a Patreon. Now, what is a Patreon? Well, let me put it this way. Do you want an extensive photo critique every month? Do you want the bed phone where well, you can directly contact me with any questions you have? Do you want to be a member of a group that's closed off on Facebook that have the same interest as you guys? That isn't about putting people down, but it's actually about helping people progress in their photography and retouching. Well, that's our Patreon. Now, by joining our Patreon, every month you can deliver one or two images. We're not that strict about it. And I will do a whole video. In that video, I will show you how I would do the retouching, what I would change about the shot, and I give you a whole lot of tips. That video is put online on a closed-off website. And it means that only the guys from Patreon can see that video and help you out. So I help you out, and the whole community helps you out. It's just an awesome way to learn. So... If you like what we do, of course, the first thing you can do is subscribe to our channels, leave comments, and smash that like button because we really like it and tell other people about it. But if you want to do a little bit more and help us out creating the awesome programs you enjoy, like Behind the Closed Doors, Digital Classroom, quite frankly, our upcoming podcast, Beyond Photography with the Doorhoffs, and a lot more, then please join our Patreon. I already know you're absolutely going to love it. So head on over to the link below and start joining our awesome group on Patreon and get a lot of benefits. Thank you so very much for supporting our work. See you online. Okay, I'm back. Um, okay, so Patreon is really cool. You already saw that in the video, but there's something else I want to tell you guys. Now, I never thought I would say this, but we recently opened up a TikTok account, yes. Now, I'm not gonna do any funny videos with walking or whatever. However, I think the concept is absolutely freaking brilliant. I never thought about it like the way I'm thinking about it now. Now, on YouTube, we of course upload a lot of material. So we have, I believe, over a thousand videos now. So we have live streams, we have uh, Photoshop tips, Lightroom tips, whatnot more. And the cool thing about, of course, YouTube is that everybody can see it. The, the problem for us as a creator with YouTube is sometimes I have tips that aren't really five minutes or 10 minutes. I often have tips that are like 30 seconds or 50 seconds or one minute. On YouTube, you get a lot of responses like, hey, the commercials took longer than the video. Yeah, of course, we have to monetize the stuff, right? So TikTok actually makes it possible for me to upload videos starting from 15 seconds all the way up to one or two minutes. And we already have some tips in there that I would normally never record for YouTube for the very simple reason. If I do something on YouTube, I want to have at least two or three or five minutes because it has to be worth your while, right? With TikTok, we found out that we can do a lot of shorter videos, which are way more interesting because it goes really fast and it's a lot of fun to do. And for me, it also triggers me to do more of those tips because I don't have to edit like an hour to get a tip out. I just film it, I edit it, and we can put it on TikTok. So, yeah, it's not the funny dances you will see me doing, but follow us on TikTok. Uh, we have the same name, Frank Dorov over there. So, okay, thank you so very much for watching, guys. This is it for Digital Classroom. We would like to thank, of course, BenQ and Rogue Expo Imaging for sponsoring us for so many seasons. It's insane. But, hey, keep doing it, and we keep thinking of new things to entertain you guys. But BenQ and Rogue, without any doubt, thank you so very much. And one final thought. Be careful out there, even if they um, put out all the restrictions, no mouth masks, no 1.5 meters, please realize there's still a pandemic going around. And I think in the Netherlands, they mostly do it also because we have to open up. You can't stay in-house for two years, especially not if you have a company, but it's not over yet. And that's the only thing I want to say about it. It's not over yet, but it's safe, of course, to go outside, but still don't act like everything is gone. So please stay safe. I love you guys very much. And I want to make sure that you guys are all safe and sound. Thank you so very much for watching, guys. See you again next time. <laughs> Bye.